Back again with another episode of the Design Build Hunt podcast. I'm your host, Josh Raley. We've got Jake Hendrickson from Whitetail Partners, Michigan, and Brennan from Whitetail Partners, New York. Guys, thanks for joining me. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Glad glad you could be on here as well. This is an interesting episode, so we've got another breakdown, uh, design breakdown. This is one I recently finished, the first of my designs that I've gotten to share. And uh, I'm excited because I get to share not only one of my designs, but that means I'm going to hand over the reins of the hosting job here and you guys have to play host for for just a little bit so i should have i should have introduced one of you as the host not me but uh <laughs> so yeah so we're going to take a peek at this 200 acre property in south carolina somewhere um not known for the biggest deer in the world but this property here and the surrounding neighborhood had some pretty nice deer on it and and i think that the sign showed there's a tremendous amount of potential, and there's some unique things about this property that made me want to highlight it for you guys tonight. So I thought I would hand over the uh, the reins to you, if that sounds uh, if that sounds all right with you guys. It does. I think yeah, we'll, we'll just try to tag team this one. So Brendan, if there's ever something that you want to say, to, yeah, just just jump in. And I guess Josh, for, to to start things off, I, I guess just kind of start by just talking about the area in general, maybe the the neighborhood and and. Uh, Maybe what you thought that you guys, what you guys could emphasize on this property to really make it stand out compared to those other other properties in the neighborhood. Right. So, you know, we've talked about that quite a bit where we zoom out and we start to look at the neighborhood and say, OK, what is being offered here? Where can we make this property stand out? And uh, from what you can see here, all of this, this all looks like it could be ag. It is not ag. It is pasture ground, um, which is going to be totally, you know basically not beneficial at all um, for the wildlife. But if you zoom in a little bit closer, you notice we are in southern pine timber country, right? Like this is being managed. Uh, the, the pines are the marketable crop on these, on these properties. And they're being managed pretty actively. Now, what that means is that there is some pretty good quality cover on the surrounding properties, as well as some pretty good pro uh, quality food. So this right here to the east of this property was all clear cut. Uh, it's been probably will be burned very, very soon. The property to the back has been totally clear cut as well. Uh, it has been sprayed and is sitting dormant as we speak right now. It's been sprayed for, I think, the last three years. So I don't know what they're planning to go back in there and, and replant, but uh, it, it's certainly um, thick certainly good cover right now. And then when you look at the surrounding property a little bit further off, some of this uh, hardwood forest up in here, down in here as well, over here on this side, a lot of that has been, um, has been had some heavy TSI work done in it. So it is a very, very, very thick jungle. So high quality cover, lots of forage on the ground. But what you don't see in this general area right here, you don't see a lot of green food. You know, if you zoom in on some of these properties, what we're not seeing is any kind of real food plot, any kind of real concentrated food source. We're not even seeing a lot of, you know, concentrated deer movement or, or features other than a couple of edges here and there that would look like they would really dictate deer movement. So we saw the opportunity, one, to put some green food on this property that is going to make it stand out just a bit. Number two, thicken up the woods just a little bit better, manage the TSI a little bit better maybe than some of the neighboring properties have to manage that cover and that food a little bit better and dictate that deer travel just a little bit more than maybe uh, it is on some of the surrounding properties so that we can have a little bit more predictable deer movement. So um, yeah, that, those are some of the things that we're gonna be focusing on here as well as you know trying to control that pressure. Right. And that was one of the first things that I noticed too, as, as you were kind of zooming in there and looking at the neighborhood that th th there was not a whole lot of food in, in, in the area. Uh, I, I guess, uh, talk to us about how you guys are going to try to, I guess, leverage habitat improvements to 
influence deer travel throughout this property. I, I can kind of see it a little bit here, but maybe if we can just zoom in on, on maybe some of your corridors and, and kind of how you're going to use, uh, you know, maybe some different habitat improvements or different habitat techniques to try to influence the deer travel as they move from point A to point B. Right. And, you know, one of the good things about this property specifically is there is some topography. There is some terrain that does dictate deer movement, and it lines up really, really well with the vegetation edge created here. So if you look at this one right here with the pines as, where they meet the hardwoods, this actually creates a nice thick transition. And wouldn't you know it, that's exactly where the deer are traveling. Um, through a lot of the wide open hardwoods, which a lot of these hardwood stands here are wide open. And when I say wide open, I mean, you can see a deer at 200 yards, very likely. Um, so very, very open, but we've got opportunities like, so there's a new food plot that we're putting in here. They wanted a location that would be easy to get to easy to take the kids to, you know, a, just a good quality hunt there. Well, this was also uh, clear cut here to the East. We know the deer are bedding out in this clear cut. They're moving from East to West over onto this property and just kind of filtering up into these hardwoods at random. Well, we wanted to guide that movement a little bit more. And so what we are going to do is come in and do about a 50 yard wide, 100 yard wide, maybe, you know, if you think about it more from a, like a funnel perspective uh, of TSI work here. And we're going to put a travel corridor right in the core of that TSI work. And what that's gonna allow us to do is have a really nice thick corridor cutting through what is otherwise wide open hardwood timber. Uh, there are lots of oak trees along in here, so there will be some staging going on inside of this uh, as the deer transition from bedding over here within the clear cut into this food plot right here. So right off the bat with just a little bit of <clears throat> TSI work and installing this food plot, we've got two, what went from very quickly went from being, oh, that's a great place to take the kids to, oh, that's a really good spot to shoot a buck, you know, uh, so very, very quickly, we have, um, we've got a great spot right there. Another thing that we've done to dictate deer movement a bit is up here in the, or over here in the current clear cut right now, we've got some travel plots cutting. Um, this was cut into a food or cut out as a food plot uh, right here. It's about a half acre in size. This will be a dove field slash late season food source for deer. Uh, there may be a possibility of converting that a little bit earlier in the year over to um, over to a deer food plot as opposed to a dove plot. But if not, it will probably sit as, um, you know, late season food for deer. But we are going to guide some of the movement because in the first couple of years, this is all going to be extremely, extremely thick uh, as it grows back in very likely what's going to be longleaf pine, uh, which, you know, in two or three years, it's going to be very, very thick. Pretty much the whole thing will become uh, essentially deer bedding that we'll have to manage in pockets as it grows older. But running these trail plots through and connecting them to this, you know, kind of little kill plot here, giving us another wind direction option is how we're going to hopefully guide these deer in and around and through, um, you know, through this here. And then also we'll have a regeneration pocket going on in the back here, circling the backside of this bedding, hopefully catching any bucks that come up out of the bedding that's on these benches over here on the side you know, gives them one really great staging area before they head out into this uh, larger kind of destination, you know, three acre uh, food plot there. But those are, those are some of the, I guess, the major features. And then when we get back here into the back of the property, we've also got uh, another perspective here, I guess you could say, on the, um, on the uh, hardwood TSI that's gonna be going on. This, like I said, is all wide open. This is a south facing hillside right along the back is the highest point of the property. And <clears throat> it looks out over this very, very large bottom. So we knew we wanted to put a lot of bedding up here, but we also wanted to encourage cruising uh, along this bedding in a, a stronger flow of movement than if it was just, um, than if it was just a couple of bedding pockets here. And so we came in and we're gonna do some TSI work along here so that we don't have the look of, wow, we've really, uh, done a lot of logging operation here. We've really cut down a lot of trees. We're just going to be pretty selective in what we do just to thicken this up and make it reasonable for travel and hopefully give him a couple of hunting opportunities with T8, 9, and 10 along the way. Yeah, I, I really like what you did there. And 
if you, if you want to go back to the the very start, uh, where sure. we, we, the bottom, I think it's the southeast corner, maybe. Absolutely. Yeah. So what you touched on there is is so similar to what we do in Michigan and in a lot of farm country areas, but you're doing it in like a like a heavy cover setting. Basically, you're taking an area that was open hardwoods, kind of a you know deer can move through there at random, uh, much like they'll move through a farm field at random, but you're giving them a basically a a funnel to move through. So right. very, very similar to how they run up hedgerows here or, or funnels here in farm country. You're doing the same thing here just with some heavy TSI. You're giving them a thick corridor to move through to connect, you know, where they like to come on and off the property right now to that food source. Another right. Thing and I, that, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, it's just a good example of where we can take certain principles like that, like creating a pinch point and saying, OK, how do we apply that to my situation? And, right. and this is how we do it. This is how we create a really great pinch point that and, you know, a little bit of a barrier here to maybe influence that movement just a little bit more, keep them, keeping the deer off our back just a touch. But, but yeah, taking those principles and applying them to our specific situation. Another thing that I really like, too, is if you can go back to your trail plot, specifically the one that runs east to west. So kind of just west of stand 13 there. I, I really like how you have those bedding areas cut on the south side of that trail plot. Because right. when, when you're dealing with a food plot, and more specifically a trail plot, it gets hard to get that plot to really grow well uh, Correct. When, it's not, when it's not running north and south. And it, that's just because there's a lot of trees in the timber, and it gets harder for that sun to hit that trail plot. And so one thing that you have to do a lot of times is cut a lot of trees down on the south on the south side of that trail plot. And what you did is basically just that you're cutting in these timber bedding pockets on the Southern side of your trail plot, which is going to allow uh, the sunlight to reach that plot and, and hopefully give that food plot more of a fighting chance with, uh, with, with more sunlight. So right. I, I, those are uh, just two things that I, I, when you were talking there, I, I really liked what you did uh, with this design. I don't know if you, yeah. you notice anything, Brennan, or have any additional questions to kind of, as we move forward on this one. Yeah, no, Jake, that was a really, really good point. And I, I absolutely love trail pot, plots, but like you just said, it's very difficult to get them to grow because of the lack of sunlight. Um, so I absolutely right. love what you did there. If, now, if you zoom out to the, to the center portion of the property there, um, I see there's some sort of body of water and I don't know about you guys, but I absolutely love bodies of water on properties. You know, it's, it's a non deer area in my opinion, where I can blow my wind. Um, there's a lot going on with thermals over top of them and being able to cheat your wind using that pond, um, or that water area. Can you, can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah. So this is a, this is actually a, a bass managed pond. Um, the, the landowners are pulling some very, very nice, um, bass out of this pond right now. They're managing it very, very tightly. And, uh, it, it doesn't, factor in too much to uh, the design on the uh, southern side. Other than that, there's going to be a lot of intrusion in here either way. There will be pond managers probably in and out. There will be landowners in and out who are taking advantage of, of the great fishing that they have here. And so, um, you know, as far as how this is going to impact wind flow, um, you know, I, these are very steep banks. And so we're obviously going to get some swirl over the top and some pull down towards this water. Um, but that's actually going to work quite well for us because of where we're hunting these specific locations like T13 and T15. We're back off of that thermal pool just enough where, you know, where this pond actually, thanks to a, a family of beavers, runs water all the way up into here right now. Very, very deep. Um, it's quite impressive. Um, the beaver pond, in fact, right here is about seven feet higher in elevation than the actual pond itself but um but yeah so we're going to get some of that flow we've already got deer bedding up above it here so a little bit of a struggle there with all right how do we deal with deer bedding in areas where um you know they're they're going to get bumped you know we're going to be walking this edge or the landowners are going to be walking this edge fishing this pond they're going to bump deer there that's okay notice here we have carved out no deer zone so <clears throat> what we, we don't want to encourage the deer in there any more than they already are. But 
Uh, but yeah, very good question. Yeah, you know, I think that's a great point. Uh, sorry to cut you off there, Jake. It, I think it's a really good point to have non-deer areas. Um, and maybe for our listeners that, that might not understand, you know, well, what does that mean? Is it mean that a deer is never going to go there? Well, well, probably not. But how can we not encourage movement to be in that area? And obviously, I, I like to see you don't have any cuttings right directly adjacent to that uh, human movement, which is awesome. That's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, and over time, we're really... We want to create an area that there isn't browse at deer level uh, in areas like that. So I really like that, that you did that in that area. Right, right. Yeah. And so this is actually, interestingly enough, this, there is a lot of deer sign in here right now. And what, what we're going to accomplish essentially is leaving this alone. <laughs> we're going to let this become closed canopy forest and, you know, remove a lot of the interest that deer currently have in being in there because it was logged at one time. And, you know, there is a lot of thick, brushy growth in here. But, you know, with a with a pond being here already, the deer are just going to be in there. They're going to be in there using that water source. They're going to relate to that. And so we're just going to keep improvements out of there. We may come in and discourage some of that with a forestry mulcher at some point and kind of, you know, clear out the, the base level understory and leave the midstory and overstory. Allow some of that to begin to shade in. Um, you know, and discourage a, a strong response again from the understory. But, but yeah, other than that, we're going to just leave it largely unmanaged. Yeah, I, I, I really like that. Exactly what you touched on there, Brennan. It, it's not that we ever say like in a no deer zone, you know, deer can't go here and you're never going to have a deer here. We're just not going to go out of our way to, to manipulate the habitat to encourage behavior in that area. So, right. And, I like that what you have too. It looks like because there is human intrusion in that area that you're you're utilizing that for access to get to some of these stands that might be more towards the interior that might be more difficult to get to. But if we're already going to have pond managers in there, you know, for the trophy bass pond, you know, we might as well take advantage of of that movement going in there and maybe be, hunt some of these more interior stand locations. Is it correct? Like kind of, um, taking advantage of that. Yeah, absolutely. That's, you know, that's something, you know, 15, 16, 17, and B3 very likely would not have made it onto, onto another plan, right? Like if there wasn't a, a, a lot of intrusion going on in here already, I probably would have left these off. But we, we've already got intrusion, not only for the, the bass pond here, but simply because of what we have to deal with, with topography on the east uh particularly the far western side, but also on the eastern side as well. If you want to get to the back side of the property, you've, you've got to cut through some of these food plots. You've got to cut through the core of the property here. So it's like, you know what? We're going to be in here already, so let's take advantage of it. And so, you know, we're scooping up the deer movement here off of this uh, upper third with T15. We're obviously, you know, really pinching that movement down right here because this is more open hardwoods. We're kind of relying on natural edge there rather than trying to put in some more uh, FSI work on that. But, you know, another trail plot. This is this is a relatively thick area that, you know, ideally could be nearly left alone for bedding, but we're going to have to make the loop around it to get to the pond. We've got to cut through this food plot, come all the way around. And so we're going to manage it with, you know, hopefully bedding on the back side of it there so we're not pushing anything too much as we come in on this main road here. Um, but then picking up a lot of that movement throughout moving them past T16 and out into the, into the food plot here. Um, you know, probably have a blend out here in B3 plot and maybe make this just a clover so that they're not uh, having the full smorgasbord, if you will, uh, back here for, for T16. You know, they, they've got something to look forward to out here in the larger plot. So we want to keep them moving there. Right. And I really like how you, you've you really utilized a, a lot of these. Uh, I'm familiar with it just because we all use the same colors with our different plans, but the, the, the viewers might not know. But th those white uh, boxes that are around a lot of this or yeah, almost every stand location, those blockades to really pinch down the movement. I really like how you are utilizing that. You want to maybe touch on that just maybe in a few spots on, on kind of you know why we use those or, or why you're using them in, in certain situations here. Yep. So, you know, a, a lot of our hunters here in the South, we have a very long, very uh, generous, let's call it, uh, gun season. Uh, gun season beginning, I think, in this portion of South Carolina is September 15th and runs all the way through January 1st. So very, very long gun season. Um, this hunter, though, really likes to bow hunt. And so because of his love for bow hunting, we knew that with more wide open timber 
and, you know, a more timbered type of setting with very few pinch points, honestly, when you're looking at a lot of this. Uh, we knew that we, we had some work cut out for us to get that deer into the 30-yard uh, section or so where he's going to be able to have a good bow shot. Now, we have, or he has hunted this property quite a bit. He's seen a lot of good deer, but getting them pinched down has been a problem. And so, you know, for instance, with T5, this is a stand that he's hunted previously. He's getting a lot of movement off of this ridge line right here. You can't really tell on Google Earth, but this is a ridge line right here. He gets a lot of movement coming from up here in this corner, kind of where these planted pines are, down the ridge and out to uh, this area right here is just littered with scrapes. Um, very, you know, typical kind of thermal hub looking location once you're down in it. Traditionally, he was accessing from this road up here, coming straight down the hill, which was fine and hunting from right here. And, you know, deer could come in from this direction. They could walk the ridge line here. So what we wanted to really do was to bring that access over to the property boundary and install these barriers or these barricades where we're keeping the deer from getting in behind him here so that we're not having to cut through the core of the property, come past this food plot, down this ridge line over here, uh, blowing out where we know deer are already bedding, and then down the hillside, you know, we're just making that access a lot cleaner. But we also knew that once we did that, we've got deer crossing this ridge line who are very, very likely wanting to stick closer to this edge already and so we're going to push them out in front of him just a bit to encourage them out closer to this area right here where you know honestly there's a lot of scrapes already so they're probably going to want to be there most of the time but we just want to make sure that they're not getting back in behind them right yeah very nice anything else brennan yeah actually josh i want to put you on the spot here so Let's just right. say this landowner, okay, he comes up with a with a scenario. Um, you know, you've put a lot of time into this. He's he's implemented the entire plan. If you had one set and he said, go hunt my property, where are you set and what conditions are you looking for? And maybe just talk about the strategy behind that that stand location. Yeah, I'm really glad that you asked that question. So uh I I would probably uh I'd probably break it up by time of year. If I'm hunting early season. I want the, I want a north wind. I want the oaks dropping in this little portion right here. And I want to be sitting right here at T14 because number one, early season, I don't want to booger a lot of my property. And so I have dri I have walked or ridden my e-bike right around the backside of this screen here. I know there won't be any deer coming from this direction. These are all homes over here. I've come straight down back door toward this strong movement that will be created here. There's already good movement in here. We've just strengthened it and narrowed it down by creating this FSI strip up out of this bedding, uh, thick bedding over here. Uh, so that's where I'm going to want to be early season. So I've got, you know, I would actually sit here pretty much any time of year. We got a mock scrape and water hole there as well. So it's going to be great for pre-rut and rut. Um, the next one, I'm probably, man, I'm torn between two right now. So, uh, T5 that we just looked at there with the barriers off the back here. Uh, I'm very, I feel very strongly about T5 and T6. They're kind of on the same line of movement. I do think he's probably going to get a shot at a very nice deer from one of these. Um, oh gosh, do I have to pick one, Brennan? You might have to, because yeah. I'm going to tell him to make sure he listens to this episode and he's going to take this. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, all right. If I've got it, I'm going to pick one of these for a rut time frame, and I'm going to pick T6. Okay. Uh, right. This is one we scoped out together. He was not already hunting down in here, but from what we saw, the amount of buck sign in this little circle right here, I, I felt like I was back in Wisconsin. Um, very aggressive rubs, lots of scrapes all over the place. And all this is wide open hardwoods right now. And so we can reasonably predict there won't be deer, you know, cutting too much out in front of us. And so we kind of know what that movement line already looks like. And it's, it's pretty obvious right now. So I'm going to pick T6 and can I throw in one more? Go ahead. Yep. <laughs> all right. This, this might be my favorite, one of my favorite spots on the property, but, but T13 here, very, very strong line of movement. There is a nice little bench down below it that you can't really tell here, but there's about a, I don't know, eight to 10 foot elevation drop from right here down to this little bench where there's, there's bedding already, but there is a strong washout cut all the way up here, leading directly to where I've got this mock scrape water hole set and a very strong trail 
running right along in here. So I would be right here, you know, November 5th, 6th, 7th, and I'm just going to hang out all day long because it's going to happen. Very good. Those are pretty good stand locations. I'd have a hard time picking myself if I if you it would, have, it would be based on wind direction, really. You know, which, which yeah, stand, which yeah, stand right. are you going to pick on at any any given day? But definitely a lot of options depending on you know, time of year and uh, the wind direction. Is, right. is there anything and, else that you want to touch on, Josh, uh, on this property plan before we wrap it up? Yeah, I think I think two things. Number one, somebody might look at this and say, "Wow, that's a lot of stands." And actually, when I met with this client, uh, first thing, you know, we do our morning meeting, right? And one of the things we talked about was like, hey, let's do like six or seven stands, you know? And once I started putting this plan together, I just realized there are too many opportunities. Um, And so these may all not get implemented, but there's a lot of great opportunities on this spot. And so, you know, just to emphasize like, hey, just because you've got a property doesn't mean you have to put all the stands there, but but boy, it sure does open up your options when you've got a bunch of them. And then uh, this backside right here, I did just want to highlight real quick, very, very tough to access this. So we've got one road really that provides decent access. You have to come through the core of the property, past the pond, through this food plot, past this spot right here where he jumps deer just about any time he drives through on a side-by-side, there are deer in here that he jumps. Um, down through the bottom, where it's currently all wide open timber, so everything in here can see you, and up to the back. So very, very difficult to access. But notice what we've done with that. We took a what was, I think, a weakness of the property, and we've turned that into a, a little bit of a strength. Number one, we've got bedding all along here, taking advantage of a couple of different uh, benches and little finger ridges that stick out. We've done FSI along the whole back side here, making this really, really thick. Uh, one that's going to cut down on some of the sight lines so that you can actually get down into here without alerting everything. But it's also just going to encourage that east-west deer movement across this backside here. And then we've taken and given those deer a great option for getting from the back ridge line over here, feeding them up into the rest of our design with this little strip here and feeding them up into it with this travel corridor coming up the side over here that kind of connects to everything else. So just to highlight where you can take a, a... a, a let's not call it a weakness let's call it a uh, a problem property and you turn it into actually one of that property's greatest strengths because this is going to hold a lot of deer and come rut he's going to have a lot of bucks in here because of it right you can take something that, that's a challenge on the property and, and turn it into one of the strengths so, yeah. there we go challenge. that's yeah. what I, that's the word i was looking for challenge yep yeah. i had my thesaurus out so i was able to bust it out really quick well, I'm glad you had it because I did not. So, yeah. Is, is there anything else that you want to uh, touch on this one, Josh? I think that's it. This is one of my uh, one of my favorite designs so far. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I it's, just it's a really a good one. Yeah, I, I really like it. And hopefully, the listeners like to have you know a little bit of a different take this time of uh, having uh, myself and Brennan host this podcast. Maybe we'll we'll see if they like this, and maybe we'll have Lee host the next one. I'm sure he, hey, would like love it. he would love it. Just throw it at him. Hey, Lee, by the way, you're hosting the next podcast. <laughs> yeah. Well, we won't, we won't tell Lee until he gets on. No, that's, so that's the thing. So you're hey, you're, Lee, up you're hosting tonight. So, yeah, I like that. Awesome. Well, guys, thanks for uh, thanks for helping me walk through that here. Uh, folks, I hope you enjoyed this design breakdown. We're going to be bringing you a few more of those. I know a lot of us have got lots of designs on the uh, on the, the editing board right now, I guess you could say being put together, pieced together, and will be over the next couple of weeks. So we've got a lot more content coming your way over on the YouTube channel. So if you haven't checked us out there, go find us, Whitetail Partners on YouTube.